so yesterday, um, Guar and Neil went through a lot of the uh, kind of big picture overview um, components to Earth observation, and they alluded to a lot of the details of the mapping process but, uh, that we've been using for the coastal mapping project. But uh, today I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail on the more technical aspects of how we make the maps. Um, still kind of in an overview format. Tomorrow I'll be giving a, like an actual demo of uh, some of the mapping, so you'll be able to actually see it in action. But today we're just going to see how the parts fit together. Just the overview of what we're going to be going over, going over before the break today. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through the two map series that we've created for this project. Um, they were both created with uh, different purposes in mind, and those purposes drove the actual you know, f end form that they took. Uh, after that, we'll be looking more at just like how the mapping process can be described as a workflow. And that's going to be more of a, that's going to be the kind of high flying part that I was talking about that just shows how all the pieces come together. And then after we take a look at all those parts, we're going to be looking at ground truthing. And we spoke a little bit about ground truthing yesterday. For Guar, that means something a little bit different than um, for someone focusing on a landscape, uh, land cover classification map. But essentially, in either case, you're going into the field, you're seeing what's going on on the ground and you're recording what you're seeing and you're using it later in the mapping process to make sure that what you're seeing in your imagery makes sense with what you're seeing in reality. So the broad scale maps, you guys have probably seen some of these maps just kind of floating around. Um, actually, I think, yeah, yesterday you, yeah, <laughs> she highlighted some of the, the broad scale maps. And they are um, island-wide maps that we've created for both the Falklands and South Georgia. And they were uh, created in Google Earth Engine. And the reason we went with Google Earth Engine, uh, rather than uh, any number of other options we could have pursued, was because uh, of its platform. It's a cloud-based platform. And basically, it allowed us to um, have access to Google's giant library of imagery um, easily. It <laughs> uh, also, at the same time, as we're getting access to all that imagery that they just have ready for people to use, it also um, it also has an API or basically a, a user interface that allows people to um, do some coding or to run some scripts that um, allow you to go into a little bit more depth in analyzing that imagery that you can grab from Google's servers. The other component, though, and the, the real kind of selling point for us was the server capacity uh, that Google Earth um, Engine has. Basically, what you can do is even if you have the worst internet connection on the island, as long as you have some reasonable connection, you can hit go on your script and it will send a message basically to Google's servers to go run the analysis that you've um, specified in your script and it will do it. But it's not doing it on your computer and you don't have a bunch of data going you know, up and down your connection. It's doing it somewhere else. It's doing it on Google's servers um, that are all over the world, but it, it really eases the load on your own, your own computer. So that was a lot of, a lot of the draw. You didn't have to download the imagery. Yes, that was the bandwidth issue. So, which is what, you know, accessing the libraries. So the Google Earth Engine platform is what we went with for the broad scale maps for those very reasons. Uh, for the first round of maps, for the broad scale maps, we went with a pixel-based approach. So in a pixel-based approach, as opposed to an object-based approach, what we'll get to in just a minute, um, you look at every single little cell, each pixel in the image, and you decide what type of landscape, what kind of land cover is represented by that pixel. And the process for that we'll get into in more detail in a moment. But each pixel, 
you're going through and you're deciding what it really is. Um, this is a bit different than object-based object approach, which breaks the ground into similar pixels, and you kind of group them together, and then you decide for an entire group of pixels what the characteristics are and what class of best is. But we went with pixel-based for Earth Engine. Um, the main source of sources of the imagery that we were using uh, for these maps um, that you know really it was what drove um, kind of the final outcome of what the map looked like was Sentinel One and Two. Uh, as Guar said yesterday, Sentinel One uh, has a lot of um, uh, synthetic aperture radar. It's really good for roughness. Uh, it lets you see texture. So, like, if you're trying to really see tussock, for example, it has a really distinct rough shape, and you're trying to discern tussock, separate it out from, from other grasses. Sentinel one's going to be really helpful. Actually, it was really helpful for that because at first we didn't have it, and you know, tussock wasn't as easy to find. We put it in, we could find tussock easier. Uh, Sentinel two, which also Guar went over in a fair bit of detail yesterday. Uh, we are using most of the bands in Sentinel-2, uh, certainly all the optical bands and a couple of the near-infrared and, and such. Um, the ground truthing that we used for the um, Brodska maps was compiled in good part by Neil and also um, by Ilaria uh, Marengo over at uh, Sorry. And we also had a lot of help from Sally Fonse last year, who was kind enough to come in and talk with us and tell us what was really on the ground in South Georgia. So, um, so far for the uh, broad scale maps, uh, what we had used for classifier was random forest. Um, the final maps for the, for the broad scale maps have actually pretty much been produced. Uh, but if we wanted, we could probably go back into the same workflow and we could try other classifiers. But so far, we'll, what we've been using is random forest classifier. And I'll be outlining that in a little bit about what precisely a random forest classifier is. Um, and the one, pretty much the last major component of the uh, broad scale maps was that we were attempting to integrate um, both, both onshore, you know, terrestrial um, inputs and offshore. Um, there, I, I would honestly say we're, there's some room for improvement for the offshore uh, part of the map. It, it needs, well, you yeah. know, it could be used some uh, polishing up, but uh, you can see certain types of kelp pretty well. Uh, other types of kelp, not so much. The deeper kelps, uh, like Lasonia, that don't really come up to the water surface, they don't really... They don't really, uh, they aren't expressed as well in the final map. But macrocystis that, you know, you can see kind of floating on the surface of the water, it shines out, you know, like a beacon uh, when you're looking at the imagery and, the, and then later on in the maps. And just to get these back in your mind's eye about kind of what, what they look like for Falklands as a whole, And then just East Falkland. So you can spend ages looking through those. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's actually really fun to go back and toggle back to the original imagery and see what does show up and what doesn't show up. Sometimes frustrating, but interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we probably can use more control from the ground truth thing on some of the grasses, to be honest. That's very true. And then switching over to South Georgia. I should, I should clarify, I'm sorry, I should have clarified this a moment ago, but the sentinel imagery that we are using for these maps was processed by Guar. And um, so it's not, most of what we used was not coming down from Google. Uh, Earth Engine, we did bring in Landsat, a couple of, a band or two from Landsat, um, but the rest was all, we can thank Guar. so. Was it taken a particular time of year? 
Uh, yes, uh, this this one was in wasn't it February? I would say January, February, and then of two thousand eight. Yeah, it was like almost entirely cloud free day, and Gar's like, I found you data with no clouds. <laughs> you guys had to see this, so we use it. So once we've uh, completed the broad scale maps um, and or well we hadn't quite completed them but they were they were well underway last year uh, when we went to the to hold the workshops with the different uh, various uh, stakeholders here in the Falklands and also in South Georgia uh, we discovered that a lot of the questions that people really wanted answered from future maps from sorry were uh, different in scope than the types of um, questions that could really be addressed with the broad scale maps. I mean, the broad scale maps, you know, they're island wide and they might give you a sense of what's going on in a very holistic way. But if you uh, want to look at questions like how far is Califate spreading in this valley or something like that, or how um, how much erosion is occurring along this stream system? Um, it's not really going to cut, not really going to cut it, or not really going to do as well as it could at, um, for a lot of questions that people really wanted answers. And we also realized that the features that people were wanting to map um, were not always going to show up uh, as well in Sentinel. Uh, as they would in, say, commercial imagery or drone imagery. So we came up with the, against the very same problems that we were talking about yesterday, like um, we needed to find a new way to do the mapping to answer the questions that people had. And we had to change not only our input imagery, but also our approach to mapping in order to really make that happen. So the fine scale maps um, are or yeah, the, the series that we're kind of, we are in the proce process of working on at the moment. And they are addressing these more detailed questions, you know, the Califante question, the erosion question. Um, rather than going through Earth Engine, uh, where we would have trouble with uploading large um, data sets uh, as an asset into Earth Engine, uh, not only just because of the bandwidth, but also because of the memory limitations for personal information, for personal imagery you can have in Earth Engine. Um, we're using uh, a GIS, pro uh, open source GIS um, program called Saga, and also um, writing some, some scripts in uh, Python's uh, so accessing Python scikit-learn library, which is um, a nice, essentially nice, well-organized grouping of code that uh, deals with machine learning uh, functions and uh, options. The Rather than going through and doing a, a pixel-based approach, like we were talking about a little bit ago, where we look at each every single little pixel in the map area, We've um, gone with an object-based approach for this side. Uh, mostly object approach show though we've uh, done some pixel-based approach. And we're not um, using very much for uh, Landsat or Sentinel in this case. We're 
using um, Worldview uh, for the most part as a basis um, for the imagery with, uh, in some cases, uh, input from the drones. We're using drone a bit more heavily in South Georgia, not necessarily because it really needs to be drone. It's more because of, in the worldview imagery that we got, that we have, um, it is, well, snow cover, and and to a certain extent, cloud that is preventing us from using worldview as much as we might want to. So, drone imagery, especially in South Georgia, uh, I should mention that. Neil was <laughs> over doing a lot of drone work just a few months ago in South Georgia and was kind enough to go get the imagery that we're using for a lot of this input. Um, we're also, for these fine scale maps, we're working to uh, try and bridge the gap a bit better with the terrestrial to the onshore side of things. So uh, we have some sites where we have a side scan sonar. So we're able to actually get a little bit of a sense of uh, the hardness of the substrate below. Um, the, at least in the shallow marine environment. And we're working to integrate that right now into a couple of the projects. Uh, again, as with the, um, the broad scale maps, the ground truth thing was mostly by Neil and Ilaria, and also recently Sally's been very, very kind and helped us a little bit more with um, some of the South Georgia, which has been very helpful. So, and in the case of the classifier, um, again, we have been using random forest for, for many of the um, maps that we've been looking at. We're also using, looking at a couple other classifiers. Minimum distance uh, is one of the other ones that has been working quite well so far. Um, but that is the fine scale maps in a nutshell. So, just to clarify what I mean by the, um, the object base versus pixel. Um, this might look a little bit familiar for, from uh, yesterday. So this is the kind of the northern extent of uh, Surf Bay right here. And you can see kind of the, the road moving around. Um, and then the bright sand for the beach and then the surf. Well, if, if, if you were going to map this through a pixel-based approach, you would be looking at each pixel all the way down the line in the grid, trying to figure out, you know, is this, is this dirt? Is this veg? Is this, you know, some sort of, you know, building? Um, but with the object-based approach, we go through and we segment this base image into shapes. So if you were going to take a marker and you were going to try and draw what you're seeing here, you might outline a shape around here like this, this roof. This is just automatically going through and doing the same thing and just making lines and making shapes. Later on, what we'll do is instead of finding the identity of each pixel in the output map, we're going to find the identity of each object, each shape, and use that shape. So I've, been, I've just been kind of droning on for a little bit about the fine scale maps and the and the um, the um, the broad scale maps, but just to t begin taking a step back so you can kind of see how the um, different working components of the workflow fit together. Um, we might think of it in more of a workflow uh, um, a work. A workflow diagram view. The ground truth thing we've already talked about, and it's a principal kind of input into the project, as is you know the choices that you have to make about what your map is going to be, um, what ex you know, how big is it going to be, what inputs you're going to have, um, what classes you would like to map and also are capable of mapping. And you also need to choose the classifier that is most appropriate for your map. And we'll get into that a little bit more in detail in a moment. But basically, just to keep in, just to keep in your mind when you're going through and you are designing your own, your own workflow, when you go to make a map of your own, 
just all the main things that you really have to remember is just think about your data, what you have available. And then think about what you really want to get in the end and whether or not you think that your input imagery is capable of getting you there. And if not, if you need to go and make adjustments either to the imagery you have or to your expectations to the map. Be ready to bring in your ground truthing and to be re also be ready that once you create the maps, you might realize you have to go back and get a lot more if some of it doesn't really um, meet the standards. Uh, some of your final map doesn't meet the standards that you want your project to, to finish up at. And basically just to bring it together and to just be ready to go around this circle a few times um, before you're really happy with your final map. But as, you know, as, I, as, as I was just alluding to, the final outcome of your map, you know, that final node that was down, down below, um, it is going to depend on what ha is happening higher up. So it makes your life a lot easier if you ask yourself early on, you know, the kind of very specific questions about what you want to end up with. So if you're, and this is a little bit like the uh, Guar's exercise from yesterday, where you need, you know, you know you want this, you know, specific map. You want a map um, that gives you an estimate of the percent ground coverage of ice uh, or snow that you've been seeing in South Georgia in a lot, over the last decade or so, and you want to know what, how it's varying by season. You're going to have to ask yourself the kind of questions that, that Guar was going over yesterday about, well, is Sentinel a good option for me? You know, is that going to have the detail? Probably, you know, if you're looking at a regional level. Is it going to have the repeatability, the temporal coverage? Yeah, probably have that. But those are questions that you really need to ask yourself earlier on or else you're going to be doing a lot of work and it's not going to get you as far as you're going to need to go. And it's just, it's really going to make it easier for your, on, on you if you ask yourself those questions earlier rather than later. And when you're actually deciding what your map is going to be, there's also a practical limitation of how, I guess you could say, not only how big in scale you want to go, but also how detailed you really need to be. The drone imagery, I mean, it's beautiful. You can see, you can see the case that we brought out for the drone. You know, to go flying that day. Uh, you can see the rear view mirrors on the truck, but you don't really need to map the rear view mirror on your pickup truck. You know, you're probably a lot more interested in like, oh, patch of bare ground. Oh, look, there's something that's actually growing. You're not actually, there's a certain level, there's a certain point when you really need to kind of take a step back. And that is just one of the other, one of the main questions that you really just need to ask yourself early on. The, the sooner you arrive at a decision about the, the level that you really want to be at, the easier it will be simply in this case because I can go through and take a, a, you know, just a snippet of worldview imagery and go through, run the segmentation, you know, make the shapes, figure out, you know, the, use a classifier to figure out what the identity of the shapes most likely are for my ground truth thing. And I can do that probably in say an hour but if i were going to run an equivalent area in drone imagery it could take most of a day and it's not because of it's not necessarily because it's inherently terribly more difficult to use the drone imagery it's just the processing time my computer needs to sit there and the wheels need to turn and turn and turn and turn so if you have reason to use the drone imagery that's great use it but just be just be going into the process understanding that you need, you have to want it to make it worthwhile. Right. Mm -hmm. Just ask, you know when you're saying about processing time of drone imagery, mm -hmm. as you're just saying then, is it, do you need to be continuously inputting stuff as it's processing or do you just sort of... No, 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 so you, you pretty much kind of set it and forget it. Yeah. And then maybe check back and make sure it's not <laughs> every hour or two. But yeah, that in that sense, it's uh, not, not too bad, but just some, you know, it's going to... It's still a process, and you can't expect it to be done just like that. 
and you know your final product also I mean just the data that you're having to deal with in store and everything like that it's going to be huge so if you have a big project and you're wanting to use a lot of drone just be ready that you know if you're going to have a bunch of products based on the drone data it's going to explode the size of your project as well um, having the extra data sets so once you've figured out okay I have an understanding of um, the imagery that I want to use in order to see the type of features I really want to be able to discern at the end of this project. Um, you need to decide to what level of detail you want your land cover classification map to really um, capture. So if you're okay um, with going through and having a project where um, you're mapping macrocystis, for example, and you can um, catch it really, you know, you're really having good luck catching it. Um, you're maybe not going to be worried too much about um, whether or not you can separate out dry from wet beach sand or something like that on shore. And you can focus on your macrocystis. Um, if you are working on grasses and all you really care about is like, can I tell white grass from non-white grass or something like that? Then you don't need to worry about going out and having an incredible amount of ground truth and trying to separate you know, each individual grass species. But if you really do care about that, then you're going to have to spend some time going through and, and seeing what really works for, for that process. So just on the grasses one, mm -hmm. the broad scale map before, I think it just said grasses. Was it did. Yeah. It was, not, not really, not with the, not with the available ground truth thing. If we were going to go through and do that, we would need to spend a bit more time with, um, you know, well, just points that are very clearly this is an example of this grass class that we want to, um, to actually have displayed in our final map. So. You need, yeah, you need more um, information from around the four points. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, we can we can see grasses breaking down grasses into finer subcomponents wasn't really happening. So, um, but that if people really were interested in that, and that's an area that's room for improvement in the future for broad scale maps. So there's no reason why someone else in the future couldn't go back and bring in more ground truthing and see if they can, you know, make that work. So. Um, 